Good afternoon. My name is Will Morris. I am the Executive Medical Director of Innovations and Ventures here at Cleveland Clinic. This afternoon, we have a fantastic panel in which we're going to frame the context of telemedicine and telehealth under the auspice of the pandemic that has obviously been top of mind and really discuss how COVID and our response as a nation and globe has pushed, changed, and evolved the application, the vision, and the deployment of telemedicine, not as just a novel solution, but one that is fundamentally at its essence, a game changer for the patient, for the provider, and I would dare say to those who are paying for, for telehealth. Um, but before we get into the dialogue, I would like to introduce um, our team and I'll, I'll start with uh, Lisa. Lisa Allison is the CEO and founder of Geno Medical. Um, and I'll let uh, Lisa share a little bit about the company and then we'll tie it back into the broader vision. Thank you, Will, and great to be here today. I really appreciate uh, everybody's um, interest in telehealth. So, Geno Medical is a company that combines both telehealth and genomics. So, we're a specialty telehealth company that sees patients in all 50 states. We are set up as a medical practice. We work in close partnership with providers and health systems and really combine depth of clinical knowledge and expertise in genetics and genomics with a technology platform that enables us to care for and see more patients. And happy to share more as we continue our discussion. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, next up is Anmon Johnson who is the CEO of the American Telemedicine Association. And and Anne might be muted. That's just like me to be able to use technology very well, seamlessly. Um, Anne Mon Johnson, happy to be here. And the ATA is the largest and longest standing voice of the telehealth industry. And we use the verbiage telehealth very broadly to include asynchronous and synchronous modalities as well as remote monitoring and really represent delivery systems, academic medical centers, payers and solution providers. And very excited to talk about what's going on. Thank you, Anne. And last is uh, Dr. Jenny uh, Schneider, physician, President of Livongo Health. Thanks. Happy to be on with everybody. Livongo Health empowers people with chronic conditions to live better and healthier lives. And we do that for three different um, through three different pillars across a number of chronic conditions. The first pillar is ease of data capture. So thinking about remote monitoring. The second is using that data combined with data science and behavioral economics to understand how to influence and change behavior for the person living with chronic condition in their own home where they're safe and, and want to be. And then the third is coupling that with a live provider. We do that with certified diabetes educators and through some partnerships with telehealth providers. So an escalation or step therapy. Delighted to get to be on. Thank you. And uh, for those keeping score uh, and expecting Dr. Peter Rasmussen, he is uh, uh, in the middle of Maine and apparently uh, is suffering from uh, cell phone coverage fatigue syndrome. Uh, it's a ICD-10 <laughs> code, I believe. Um, and so he will be unable to uh, physically join us, um, although he's going to be texting some of his pearls and I will do my best to, uh, to channel a neurosurgeon. This is a simple internet. Um, and and uh, you know would be happy to share um, his work uh, in the partnership of, of Cleveland Clinic and American Well. I, I thought I'd start foundationally and and, and kind of ask Ian to share you know two years at um, the ATA and from her you know executive standpoint kind of a shift in, in the strategy. We had a little conversation before and I thought it was a, it was really pragmatic kind of a framing setup of the why, why telemedicine? Sure, happy to. And when I joined the ATA two years ago, it was clear that the association, which had been started 25 years before by the pioneers, the researchers, the academicians who really created this industry, um, it was organized very much as a professional society and was really um, 
in spite of the fact that the technology had been available for 25 years, the reality was that the adoption was pretty anemic. And so when I joined, I thought it was important to change the story. And the story is why we're here, which is I think represented by Jenny and Lisa and everyone else, which is we're here to ensure that people get care where and when they need it, that when they do, they know it's safe, effective and appropriate while ensuring that clinicians can do more good for more people. And the advantage of focusing on why is that, number one, it allowed us to really expand the definition of telehealth in terms of what it included. And then likewise, it enabled us to engage more audiences in the discussion. And so uh, I think it's safe to say that the pandemic has brought about enormous rapid change and we are working with our members and partners to ensure that many of the changes become permanent. Yeah, and, and, and I loved it from uh, Anne, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Lisa, um, a little bit about, you know, genomics is, is obviously much like tele telemedicine that has been there, but is missing the why, the what's in it for me. Um, from your perspective, from, you know, a founder of Genome Medical, tell us a little bit about that framing question of the why. Yeah, first let me just comment on kind of the surge in telehealth and what we've seen, and then I'll circle back to the genomics specifically. But, you know, there's a couple of stats that I think would be interesting to the audience, one of which was reported by Epic that telehealth visits had increased 300x uh, during the COVID pandemic. Um, and the second is actually from one of our partner organizations, Kaiser Permanente, who we do work with. Uh, in one of their regions, and they noted that um, this was reported in the late April timeframe, they were up to about 80% of their total visits via telehealth, and that was up from about 15% prior to COVID. And so we're definitely seeing, uh, you know, the benefits of telehealth, which have always been present from a convenience perspective, but have really moved into the forefront from a necessity perspective. Uh, as patients are sheltering in place uh, in their homes. Uh, what I will say about health and genomics, so genomics really relates to our molecular makeup and uh, typically a consultation around a genetic or genomic uh, kind of service, you know, relates to an understanding of one's health history, one's uh, family health, uh, an understanding of uh, you know, a particular medical need, which then leads to a selection of genetic or genomic testing and delivery of results back to the patient to inform clinical care. And that clinical care is either around uh, prevention or around diagnosis or around selection of treatment options, including informing surgical decisions. And so what's interesting about telehealth and genomics is that so much of that session can be done in a virtual visit, very much like the conversation we're having right now, uh, because though in pediatric genetics and kind of rare forms of genetic conditions, a physical can be really important for cancer genetics and cardiovascular genetics, there really isn't a component of the physical that is needed, which makes mm -hmm. it extremely attractive to perform via telehealth and also attractive to perform via telehealth because there are very few specialists in the country. And so these are clinicians that are in very high demand in very short supply. And so telehealth enables us to be able to reach patients no matter what zip code they're in, uh, even if they're not right around the corner from an exceptional organization like the Cleveland Clinic. And, and uh, Dr. Schneider, I'm curious, you know, so a little ago, I think, a lot of people were aware of, of Livongo before, uh, you know, COVID hit, and certainly, you know, with your tremendous successful IPO. Um, but I'm curious, from a chronic disease standpoint, how has COVID perhaps either pivoted or changed or shaped um, Livongo's uh, strategy? Um, it's a great question. Thank you. I, I would start by saying um, we know in the setting of coronavirus that those of us living with chronic conditions are no more likely to be infected, but when we are infected, we're more likely to develop severe consequences. 
we know that 78% of all people in an intensive care unit have one or more underlying chronic conditions. And so this idea around keeping those of us living with chronic conditions outside of the healthcare ecosystem where there's lots more of infection, if you look at infection rates and density, has, is really important. So allowing people with chronic conditions to stay at home, to stay healthy, and to empower the care in that environment is what Livongo has been about from the inception. I, coronavirus has not changed our strategy. Yeah. It has, it, like telehealth, accelerated the acceptance of these very strong business models that were in existence before the pandemic. And so I think there's a broader realization and an understanding of the value from remote monitoring to telehealth in this current setting that mm -hmm. because of the experience, I don't think people will ever go back. It's the same as you think about in travel, you're unlikely to go wait for a travel agent in their office. You're now accustomed to going on and booking your own flights, Travelocity, direct on United. And so very similarly, the healthcare ecosystem has turned for those people, we call them members, people with chronic conditions, the end user have experienced something different that is actually of greater value in the healthcare ecosystem. So it's not a direct impact from strategy. It's a, an acceleration of the business of what we've been doing for the past many years as many tele teletherapy providers and telehealth providers have been doing. And, and, and as I think about um, and I'm, glad, I'm so glad that you put this out there. I, I hear a lot of, I can't wait until we return to, quote, normal, right? Oh, vaccine will be returned to normal. And, and actually, I, I actually think that is, 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 to your point, regressing back to healthcare normal um, is, to me, uh, is actually more frightening, um, as frightening um, as, as, you know, this current pandemic. I think, and I hope, and I hope your hypothesis is correct, there is no regression to well we now can do physical you know visits and people feel the need to drive in for a, a genetic counsel i'm curious though because there's kind of three stakeholders the patient um the providers or health system and then there's the payer of those three and, and kind of you know now that we've been forced into this realm you know is it all three that see the value do do all of you see, you know, consumers being the driving force. Like, what will prevent us from regressing back to the mean? Um, I'll, I'll start, but want to hear from the other panelists. Um, so first, I, I want to make one sort of snarky comment, which is I do hope parts of our, our um, ecosystem return to normal, particularly schools. That will be really helpful for those of us who are working with while homeschooling children. So, <laughs> from a healthcare delivery standpoint. Um, I do think um, that it is all three, that there's a value proposition for all three, for the consumer, for the provider, and for the payer. When I look at Livongo's results, people love the experience, they're clinically getting better, and, and they're, we're saving money for the end payer, the person responsible. So th that means the consumer wins because they love it. The clinical improvement means physicians win because they get paid more money based on outcomes. And then the, we're saving the overarching payer or large self-insured employer money, so they win as well. However, I think that the incumbents in the system, um, the payers and the providers are more just entrenched from a behavioral standpoint that the behavioral change of getting to stay in your house, getting to you know, connect with a genetic counselor at the Cleveland Clinic when you live in you know, Podunk, where I grew up in Minnesota, right? So that, that, that benefit from the consumer will not allow the rest of the ecosystem to revert to quote unquote normal, but I think all players benefit. Yeah. yeah, I would agree with that. I was just going to comment that from I come from uh, actually a consumer and technology perspective before I moved into genetics and genomics. And there's this underlying premise that you have to, you know, activate a consumer with the first, you know, kind of a first encounter. And because telehealth, there's been this forcing function with COVID, I think we've many consumers who've had their first telehealth visit. And so they're now activated. And to Jenny's point, they've enjoyed that. They've seen the value, they've seen the convenience. And so that I think will be the driving force that requires ongoing access because patients will seek out, 
you know, what is convenient. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, that will be the driving uh, mechanism. I would share that from a geneticist and genetic counselor perspective. First, there are only 2,000 geneticists in the entire United States. And there are about 4,500 genetic counselors in the entire United States. Most of those are located at leading academic centers. So part of the value of telehealth here is that you are providing access to clinicians that many patients would otherwise not have. And so there's, there's sort of an efficiency gain, which means from the provider's perspective, they get to see more patients, they have greater impact. Uh, but it also means from the patient's perspective that we can route to the right specialist who might be states away from wherever they live. And so not having to, you know, take extenuating travel to be able to see these specialists is incredibly convenient. And so I think it's that same value proposition that Jenny noted is magnified in genomics mm. because of the scarcity of those specialists. And what we do today is we route all the patients from every zip code into, you know, these few specialists as opposed to take the knowledge of the specialists out to the patients in, you know, in every zip code. So I, I would say that you touched on a really interesting point, Lisa, which is something that I think we have a tendency to forget, which is nationally and globally, there was an insufficient clinical workforce to deal with our population worldwide, aging, multiple conditions. And so what we've always promoted at the ATA is this notion that telehealth and technology in general should be used to reimagine care and reimagine how we interact with patients, how we interact with providers. And if you look at some of the more successful players like Livongo, there's, um, they're monitoring as much as possible and they're automating as much as appropriate. And I think there's something to be said there because not only do we have an insufficient number of geneticists, we have a scarcity of uh, behavioral health specialists and yet most Americans at this point are having some sort of mental health crisis. So I think technology is being really used to scale and reimagine. If we just use telehealth and technology to replace a face-to-face -face visit in the same vein, I don't think we're going to be any further along. And so that's what's exciting to see out of Genome Medical and Livongo and others like that. Yeah. I love the idea of not just recapitulating, uh, you know, what we've done before. I think our medical records are a reflection of that we took paper and recreated it electronically, but we didn't reimagine the way that as providers, we actually engaged in the record, right? It's slices of information that is oftentimes conflicting. So I, I couldn't agree more is um, in healthcare, when we digitize something, we just make it electronic but we actually don't reimagine. I think this is a prime example, um, a, a really, really germane one to reimagine kind of the value. On that end, so, so um, and you and the ATA have been absolutely instrumental and in, I think educating and creating awareness, but also helping policy and helping, you know, bring together a coalition, if you will, around the why. Help us understand kind of some of the big um, waves of changes that, that you feel under the pretense of COVID has, has opened the door, whether it be payment parity or interstate licensure? So a couple of things. One is that we have been, I mean, this is a really uncommon time. That's a, I have an astute grasp of the obvious, but it's really <laughs> a huge opportunity for us to ensure that these, this catch up between regulations and technology, what we can do that that's maintained going forward. And so one effort is at the federal level. And to that end, um, last week we submitted along with two other organizations and 340 sign on organizations, a letter to the congressional leadership. And what was interesting about that was um, First of all, there were 340 organizations that signed on. And then secondly, this was not a letter filled with platitudes. There were very specific asks that we went after. So the most important thing that I think we overcame with this relaxation was um, removing the restrictions on where people are. So again, the why. We want to get to people where and when they need it. 
And then I think the other is, you know, uh, supporting that is with the federally qualified health centers to make sure that they're able to continue to provide telehealth services. And then there's certain authorities that we think should be maintained and enhanced for HHS in terms of determining appropriate providers and services for telehealth. The interstate licensure is an interesting issue because, again, what we found at the ATA was that while there are many who advocate for a national licensure, I think that's a pretty big sword to fall on right now. And instead, yeah. what we're really doing is promoting the use of compacts and, and saying that those should be enhanced, that should be accelerated, and should be more widespread. Um, the second is the notion of parity. And we have policy principles that we released at the ATA that were drafted by our policy council, which represents the diversity of our membership. And what we said there was that from a payment parity perspective, and again, this is a very nuanced position, we believe that federal programs, Medicare, Medicaid, should be at parity, payment parity. But that because there are so many different payment arrangements and um, relationships between providers and payers, we didn't want to get into the middle of that. And we didn't want to set what should be pricing between two different parties. So we think that Again, we'll see a lot of um, uh, energy around those sort of things, but a lot of work to be done, both at the federal level and, and many of the states. Tremendous, and, and you're exactly right. It's 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 never ending. It's this is the journey. This is and, and it still feels very much at the uh, at the beginning, uh, you know, steps. I'm I'm curious, you know, beyond kind of policy, um, education, and advocacy, and and uh, I'd love to kind of hear. Um, from all three, you know, it's one thing to have great technology and, and, and you explain pragmatically of, of, of the shortages of genetic counselors, but where's the change management, you know, is it the consumer or, or is it all three? What, what percent of your time is spent really, you know, advocating around the why and explaining the why and not about the technology? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in on that. So, you know, I see the technology and particularly in light of COVID is really enabling patient engagement and then care navigation for, so I look at it this way. Um, there've been some pretty alarming stats just around the number of patients that are obviously not coming in for routine medical care and just taking, you know, cancer screening as an example, rates of, you know, mammograms and colonoscopies and, uh, cervical cancer screening are down about 90%. And so what we've also seen is a dramatic decrease in the diagnosis of cancer. Well, we clearly know cancer did not stop for COVID. It simply is not being diagnosed. And so we have a whole bolus of patients who are now going to need to work their way back into that routine medical care and screenings. And one of the areas that Genome Medical is investing in is a technology platform that enables that patient engagement uh, and assessment using, you know, algorithms to be able to flag the high risk cancer uh, patient and then to kind of triage and navigate those patients back into clinical care and genetic testing where, you know, medically appropriate. And so as part of that, I see this as a really important solution for health systems that now have, you know, this bolus of patients that have not been seen, many of whom may be at elevated risk. And so how do you create the catalyst to bring the patient back in for clinical care? And how do you, uh, you know, kind of segment and triage those that are at the highest and most elevated risk? Yeah. Jenny. From from uh, Lavano's perspective, and how again you, you've set that trajectory. You probably do a lot of education and advocacy, but how is you know COVID and, and the dialogue right now is that changed, accelerated, or just created a a bigger a bigger platform to kind of share the vision? Yeah, I I see the world as um, you know coronavirus and uh, has really accelerated access issues for at the forefront. I think that was um, part of what Lisa was just saying. But the, to me, the value in this combination of, um, you know, consumer directed virtual care, which is this combination of remote monitoring connecting into providers 
is the longstanding value. And so we use the phrase powered by technology, guided by humanity. And in order to actually have the value, it's not just can you put a Band-Aid on a current current problem? How do you show the value to the ecosystem at, at writ large? And so, you know, we focus a lot on is the experience better for people? Are there clinical improvements and is there cost savings? That's not a Band-Aid in the setting of the pandemic. The pandemic has highlighted access needs. But if you think about the value of this, you know, consumer directed virtual care model, which is encompasses remote monitoring and telehealth, it's really kind of those value propositions at the end of the day that's going to, you know, stay, have the staying power. Coronavirus to me is really just an accelerator of adoption um, in terms of the front door, the first experience, but it's, it's not it's not enough to just have that. It has to have those value propositions above and beyond. And thankfully, there are a number of companies, people in the ecosystem who have done that. And as providers, now it's there used to be telehealth companies, right? And there still are. But now everyone whom I went to med school with practices medicine via telehealth. And so it's not this new thing. That access channel has now been open. So it's the value stream down below that becomes incredibly important for staying power. Oh, that's great, and and I like your, your your phrase guided by humanity, and which makes me think as as while we talk about the pandemic of COVID, there's certainly a pandemic, if you will, for for our nation facing around just simple health disparities and what is going on at the national dialogue level, which is long overdue. I'm curious, and again, open for for uh, all of you, your thoughts on how telehealth telemedicine addresses this core kind of elephant in the room around health disparities and access? I, I would just say that um, it's very clear historically, again, access has always been an issue, but if you look at the Dartmouth Atlas in the 1990s, the variation at a county level, a geographic level was amazing yeah. and quite frankly, horrible. And your geography was your healthcare destiny. I would submit that we will have success as an industry if the variation that we see is eliminated. And I think technology and telehealth broadly can help accelerate that. It's not gonna do it on its own, obviously, but I think we have an important role to play because of things like being able to monitor much, many more people using technology than perhaps we had in the past. And um, so forth, but I think it's going to take a real concerted effort and it's going to be, it's going to have to be a priority for us in a way that has not been. And, and I think some of what you're seeing from a legislation to, to um, you know, add on to Anne's earlier comments and the most recent comments is, you know, we're, we're seeing a bipartisan bill sponsoring a $50 million um, remote monitoring to target underserved, underserved populations. And so there is a movement that is being led um, by legislation to change uh, the access and the reimbursement to help infiltrate into those areas that have been previously less in, um, infiltrated. And I agree with Anne, you think about what does, you know, um, sort of the population writ large have at common, have most in common, and it's an access, the majority of people whom have a smartphone today. So technology as a leveler, in terms of being able to uh, uh, provide services that are valuable. I think there's an the inherent um, uh, 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 responsibility on top of that to provide solutions that are uniquely tailored because a solution for me with a smartphone may not be the same solution for somebody else with a smartphone. That personalization above that to drive outcomes is incredibly important, but technology is in many ways a le levels the playing field for sure when it comes to access um, in the healthcare arena in this current environment. It, so actually, it, I'll inter, 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 intersperse a question from uh, an audience because I think it, dies in, it dials into access, but what about those patients who are not necessarily tech, technically competent um, or agile with it? For example, an older patient, say with a movement disorder, Parkinson's, who have a difficult time navigating with a device. How does this fit into, you know, those patients? Yeah, I can comment for Genome Medical. We, we do enable video uh, consultations as our preference, but a fallback to a phone-based consultation is 
you know, certainly um, at the election of the individual. And so, you know, I, I think we've we've shown though, and I think this is one of the benefits of the the convergence on telehealth that, you know, and this is more anecdotal, but I can't tell you how many 80 year olds I've talked to who've had telehealth visits and loved it. And so I think there is an aspect of uh, some of that has been refuted as um, uh, most are quite capable. And then I think the, the fallback into a, you know, a phone based consult is kind of the way uh, mm -hmm. to address that. I did want to just speak briefly on the disparities of access to healthcare, though, because I think it's such a really important topic. And frankly, I founded Genome Medical with the vision of how do we democratize access to genomic based medicine, which is one of the greatest advancements in healthcare in at least our lifetime uh, to be able to make genomics much more accessible to patients everywhere. And it's a topic I care really deeply about. And so I think in particular in genomics, it's an area where we know uh, that scientifically a lot of large scale databases are underrepresented in uh, ethnic uh, kind of diversity. And therefore, I think it's an area where uh, we have a higher degree of responsibility to really um, you know, change that uh, because the science leads the medicine. And therefore, if we don't have access to robust diversity of information from a scientific database perspective, it could um, have implications downstream in terms of medical management guidelines. And of course, at the NIH level, all of us uh, is a program initiated to increase uh, inc you know, diversity in genomic research databases. Uh, and there are other efforts all around the globe to help support this. But there's, it's a complex area where, you know, at Genome Medical, we've made actually five different commitments, one around diversity of access and research, uh, but also around how we, we can overcome the education and access to communities that are historically underrepresented um, <clears throat> and overcoming some of those access issues. Yeah, the one thing I, the one thing I want to add there is I think um, Lisa talked about this, but it's really important to, as you're building out digital solutions, to not assume that one, like everybody's going to go to the same place. One of the really important key tenants for us is we meet people where they are. So it's not actually even safe to say young people want to use, you know, videos. They don't. They want to text. And so everybody has their <laughs> own utilization. And so, you know, we allow phone, uh, text messaging, a video messaging, Alexa, smartwatch, we integrate to where other people, where people live their lives. And that's not just a spectrum of age, it's a spectrum of geography, it's a spectrum of race, it's a spectrum of other preferences, life preferences. People pick how they live their life and to be able to take a digital solution and fit into their life lanes, rather than asking any of those cohorts to fit into yours, is how you build this at scale. And that personalization is incredibly important to be effective over the, the big population. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah I, I would just add on to that, Jenny, that uh, the whole idea of user experience and the user-centered design is incredibly important. And we have, not just in telehealth or in healthcare, we've, we've really fallen short in a lot of instances. And so I think we'll see renewed focus on that going forward. So a lot of what we'll see is disproving some myths associated with telehealth, that it's only for younger people. I think people, it's its more than just convenience. It's a matter of life and death. But I also think there are populations that have, we've really um, shortchanged them. And um, those, we have to address those, not only because of disparities, because these are populations that have disabilities of one kind or another that we have to address. So I think it's pretty exciting. I think there's a, a much more expansive dialogue now than there has been before because of the gas thrown on the flame and so much that's happened in the last several weeks. Yeah, no, it, it, it certainly is exciting. And just, you know, hearing from you all is enough to, you know, we can't move fast enough. We need to, and you're exactly right, is our 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 patients, consumers, however you want to, you want to stress, you know, they are asking for this and, and we need to meet them where they are as mm -hmm. opposed to, I don't want to say an egocentric, but a very, you know, physician system centric of the patient will see you now and it should be flipped. Um, 
on that navigation, and and I think uh, Jenny, you had, had brought up the analogy of we're not going to go back because it was like uh, travel agents. Um, and now you can book it on, online and it's good. But navigation of all of these applications, will you see a convergence? Will there be a kayak, if you will, or Travelocity or whatever, as a confluence of all of these systems? So you know, a patient can have a single pane of glass, if you will. Or will there be like Southwest, where they don't post and you got to go. That's that's their thing. If you want to fly a Southwest airline, you got to use their site. And it's, you know, it's kind of the best of breed versus the, you know, the kind of the centralized master. Do you see any declaration of which way that'll go or will it always kind of be, um, you know, varied? Okay. Um. So I'll, I'll, I'll start. I, so I think that at the end of the day, that will be driven by the consumer. And in most industries, consumers have a very distinct idea of not wanting to have multiple disjointed um, experiences. And so I do think that this will coalesce to, to something or some things that will drive that overarching holistic experience for the consumer. Now, that may not be the whole population writ large in America. It may be people with these sort of conditions fit into this, these needs fit into this solution. But I do think simplification, um, because I don't want to pull up 14 different apps to decide how to, how to live my life or 14 different apps to find the directions to go to the grocery store, right? So you want to find the one that works. It's just, I think simplification as a principle is, is pretty powerful. I would agree. I also think that there's there's a benefit of integration. So if you think about medicine, we've actually kind of taken the patient apart in most cases because mm -hmm. you have a primary care doctor, but then you have specialists and the congruence and that coordination of care across multiple physicians has always been quite a challenge. And so part of the beauty of reimagining healthcare delivery, and from my advantage point with genomics as a as a, a cornerstone in that, which is you know our molecular DNA, it's our life code. It kind of relates to our health in a very deep way. Uh, but that the the consumer engagement and care pathways that you can navigate, and even little things like reminders, you know, of that next doctor visit. Uh, that should be occurring and, you know, that specialist referral that you forgot to follow up on. And I, I think it really can enrich what the consumer experience um, is, but also, frankly, improve outcomes because I think it will improve, uh, you know, sometimes referred to as compliance, but effectively a follow through and uh, appropriate care for patients. I would just add in terms of the navigation issue and I think healthcare has been confusing for literally dozens and dozens of years. So prior to joining the ATA, I was in a series of startups that were all focused on helping consumers navigate the healthcare system using data and digital mobile apps and decision support tools. And not much has changed. And unfortunately, we have a lot of vested interests uh, as a society, and they're put out there in term, and, and called, um, they're there because of patient safety or protecting patient interests, but in point of fact, that's not the case in many of those instances. So I think we, we should have, as we look at the dialogues about what went well with this pandemic, it's gonna be incumbent on us to really force some conversations about what we do differently going forward to simplify it and to make it easier for people. That's a tremendous observation. What a, what a missed opportunity that we oftentimes don't reflect back and, and uh, say, what could we have done better? What would it make it better? And, and, and on that note, um, I, will, I will get to a point. It, it's around um, data. We talked about policy, change management, adoption, education, um, but there's data and, and I'll frame it in the setting of, of you know, what I saw as one of the, the, the earlier embarrassments or opportunities around COVID was each lab testing actually called the result differently. And I actually was tested positive. And so I had a positive result, but actually at a parent institution, it's called reactive. And so there were issues around people claim interoperability barriers and ability to have that seamless experience. And there's a data issue. Um, and, and it's incumbent usually on the health system or the lab system or whoever's building an app 
to create their own schema. I'm curious, actually, I'll start with Ann, you know, ATA's perspective of, of how do we, you know, if, if the transformation model is predicated on free, you know, exchange of data and what you call um, a social determinant or a positive result or um, a hemoglobin is the same thing and that way we can share data and it actually makes sense. Um, what is the role at the federal level? Do you see it at the state level or do you see it actually as industries kind of come together and adopt open standards? You know, how, how do we address that barrier? Well, that's probably another webinar if yeah. you want to know the truth. So yeah. uh, <laughs> I'll just say that one of the things that we've noticed at the ATA and have talked a lot and written about is the issue of interoperability and telehealth interoperability. And that has really been an unnecessary and onerous burden on clinicians as they try to um, take care of their patients. So. I would say that that's something that we've been advocating for and we will continue to push for. Um, my preference personally is to always have an industry-led solution. Um, so that, that's something that we, I think we'll see more of. Yeah, I'd like to share just one uh, kind of anecdote, I guess, of how I think the greater access to data can really have an impact. Um, my co-founder, Dr. Robert Green, who's a leading medical geneticist at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital, recently uh, published an article in Nature that spoke about at, at Brigham and Women's, uh, they have a biobank uh, of patients who have come through uh, that now as those patients have arrived being COVID positive, they're analyzing the results to try to determine if there are any you know, factors, molecular factors or biomarkers that would indicate either increased risk uh, or increased uh, potential of severity of COVID uh, or just insights into how to treat. And, you know, though still preliminary, um, there are some pretty interesting results and in looking at, you know, genetic markers that would either, you know, due to potential um, pulmonary conditions or even long QT syndrome affect what uh, medication might be recommended, uh, but there's some pretty interesting insights. And so I, I think that's one of those cases where if you could take some of that data, and again, this is one particular case, looking at uh, individuals who have a biobanked sample, uh, but now are COVID positive, how do you harness the insights of that information, both the phenotype of the patient as well as the genotype to now draw some conclusions that can improve how we practice. Um, you know, it just illustrates, I think, and again, one case, uh, but the example of how if we could connect a lot of those data sets together, we could accelerate both the scientific discovery and ultimately uh, improvement in clinical care. That's that's. A, a great example of the why, and I think that's, you know, interoperability is not just, yeah, EMR bashing and looking for a plug, it's it's, it's articulating the why, so I agree. Uh, and it it, it, it owes, a, owes its own webinar, because um, the topic is so, so rich. Um, we got one question, um, you know, uh, from, from the webinar is, is who pays for, for telehealth, how, how, how does this transition happen and, and who, who's actually paying for it? Um, we're not just adding cost, but we're driving value. Well, I'm happy to start that, which is, I think we're all very interested in keeping costs down. I think that pre-pandemic telehealth was okay in many instances in a fee-for-service environment, but really shown brilliantly in a value-based environment. So I think we'll have more conversations along that line. Um, certainly that's one that the ATA is engaged in. Um, but generally speaking, and, and there's a lot of work going on around this, I think that it is proving to be, it, that it's more expensive or additive is one of those myths around telehealth that we've been disproving with the pandemic. And I think what you'll see is more data coming out around that. Jenny, your experience? Oh. Uh, sure. Uh, so, 
Costco um, is paid for the people who uh, pay the financial bill for those people living in the chronic condition. So those could be insurance companies, those could be large self-insured employers, those could be provider groups who bear the financial risk. Um, and so they see that cost savings, it's a benefit to people living with chronic conditions on their behalf, and they're happy to pay for those services because they actually see a financial return on investment hundreds of clients, peer reviewed academic Milliman statistical analyses. And so, um, so that's, that is who is paying for the Livongo services in this remote monitoring consumer directed virtual care word world. Yeah, and our, our model is similar. So we do work with, um, insurers and, uh, we have a pretty clear ROI on that about a five X, uh, return on investment because genetics and genomics is so complex that it's been shown that often the wrong test is ordered. And so it, by navigating to the right specialist, you're, um, getting the, the right test and the, and the right care path for the patient, uh, which yields a nice, um, ROI on that visit. Uh, we also work with self-insured employers and uh, large employer organizations in general, um, and then health systems and uh, provider groups will also, in some cases, either subsidize or partially subsidize our services in order to um, create access, which then creates continuity of care for the patient. Uh, you know, to progress towards, in some cases, it's surgery, in some cases, it's, um, you know, better decision making around uh, ongoing clinical care for the patient, but it allows for the continuity of care for that patient in that health system. So I was going to ask my last ringer question, but actually, I just, I just got a, a litany of great, even better questions than my, uh, my pathetic one. So I, I will pass this one out. It's, it's, it's great. Um, so this is, uh, we have someone on the call who probably represents a, a private company, a startup, if you will. But what steps can a private company take to democratize healthcare such that location and probably control of the patient, but, but is no longer the primary care's um, domain uh, in terms of which, you know, who gets the care? Um, so it sounds like, you know, how does a company navigate that to uh, make themselves avail to to a, a patient that otherwise might be triage, say, from the primary care or a, a patient, you know, center uh, medical home. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that one. It has a really interesting implication in that you think about the catchment funnel for patients. If you remove, you know, the physical barrier of where you drive to, it really opens that up. And so, if anything, I think that puts more power in the hands of the individual. And in the case of precision medicine, we know that patients uh, will in some cases select their provider because they have access to precision medicine. And so I think that has a backdrop that will accelerate adoption of technology uh, because it, it kind of um, get, you know, again, puts the, the power in the hands of the individual to select uh, how they're receiving care and where they're receiving care from. So I think an innovative provider group or health system uh, that is working towards innovation in care delivery and working towards innovation in bringing forward precision medicine models uh, stands to compete best in that kind of environment. Yeah, I think democratization from geographic location, there seems to be two answers. One is don't have any geographic. So that's sort of the world of telehealth. You can get, deliver it from anywhere or have have a physical place everywhere, which is some ways you're seeing that in the Walmarts, Walgreens, CVS kind of where they either within X number of miles to X percent of the population. I actually think and so both of those are in play and that's great. That's great for um, healthcare in general. I actually think the bigger way to democratize healthcare is give patients their own data. Like, like there should be absolutely no barriers around people having access to their own data. You know, the interoperability has been really hard and there's lots of walls to protect businesses that have been up. And we talked a little bit about this, but I actually think the easiest way to flip that is make it incredibly easy and mandate that people get their own data, not that they have to go through 14 steps and sign 14 forms and go to the bottom of the basement to kind of get the the floppy disk that no one can read on, but like just make it really easy. And that allows the individual person to either then opt for this world where there's no geographic division or opt for a world where I'm gonna choose geographic division, but there's enough 
penetration in those different geographies. Awesome. So we got another, uh, so, so one who expressed appreciation that we uh, address the, the importance of diversity. Um, but regarding the data is these underserved populations oftentimes have a paucity of data. They may not have access to internet or digital tools. And so it's kind of a catch point too is we don't have the data, they don't have the access. So how can we actually um, make ourselves available um, to these vulnerable populations? Um, and, and you kind of touched on this with some of the, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, funded studies to do so, but I'm just, you know, curious if you could comment on, you know, what are the pragmatic steps to ensure that we are not missing these underserved populations? Well, unfortunately, we can see it on maps already, right? And you can see the death rates and you can see in Chicago, where I come from, that, you know, in Illinois, while I think it's 14% of the population is black, 40% of the deaths are among the black population. So you can map that out. You can see where we have problems already. And again, this was not a mystery before. It's just we underestimated or didn't expect the toll that it's taken. So I think that you'll see a lot of very important work going forward as we move this. I mean, there are a lot of people who are very committed to addressing this, and I'm encouraged by that. Yeah, Genome Medical, we are um, seeking partnerships with advocacy groups and professional societies to try to magnify our impact that we can have uh, at a more holistic level, uh, because I do think it will require uh, significant effort from multiple organizations to holistically address. Um, we certainly see alarming stats like black women die of breast cancer um, at a much higher rate than Caucasian women. Uh, you know, um, there, there are clear disparities uh, that, you know, result both from access to healthcare, but also timing of diagnosis. Um, uh, and so it's, yeah, again, as I said earlier, an area that's really dear to my heart. And so uh, we are actively seeking partnerships to help uh, in that regard. So we'll end, uh, so we have a, a minute left and we'll ask for a, a pithy comment from each of the panelists. It's 2021. I know people are probably going to be nostalgic for 2020, but we'll uh, we'll put that aside. Other than we're going back to school and we can actually enjoy uh, social interactions uh, somewhat. Um, what would success look like? What would be when you look back in the 18 months and say, wow, what we have done is transformative. What would that be for you, whether it be within your own company or, um, you know, in, in your genre? What, what would success look like in 18 months? Well, I'll start by saying that I think that what success looks like is that we have acknowledge that people should get care where and when they need it and that we have made that law and had it expressed in law and take advantage of the fact that this is truly a bipartisan issue and people can get behind it and that we have once and for all said yes this is telehealth is health regardless of modality this is what we have to do and we've done it Summarize my viewpoint is, you know, tech enabled clinical care is here to stay. I think telehealth is a portion of that. I think there's a mm -hmm. lot more of, you know, clinical enablement tools, clinical decision support tools that ultimately enable the best of, you know, the combined kind of clinical expertise and uh, technology uh, that ultimately improves patient engagement and improves outcomes. And ultimately, we hope also improves cost of care. Yeah, I would just add to both wonderful ideas is that this um, the concept that we as people deserve the, the best that technology today can offer. And that is a totally different experience than the existing healthcare system. And that by reinventing that experience, we will absolutely delight more of us, motivate more of us, improve clinical outcomes and trim waste and cost because we're in a very wasteful system that is 
been driven not by the needs of the individual person, member, patient, whomever, but by the healthcare ecosystem, and that there will be a uh, joining together recognition and a joint rec uh, working together to deliver what we as consumers have mandated in every other industry, yet have not been able to do that in healthcare. Yeah, so oftentimes it's, it's not innovation, it's imitation in every other vertical, it seems, that is, is paradise. Um, so uh, on behalf of the Cleveland Clinic, I just wish to extend uh, absolute humble uh, thank you. Uh, it was enriching and rewarding for me. The questions, um, uh, I apologize for those that we did not get to, uh, but we will do our best to uh, digitally and virtually um, uh, uh, answer those. But I wish to first thank uh, Lisa as co-founder of Genome Medical. Uh, Anmon Johnson is the CEO of the American Telehealth Association. And if you have not signed on to the pledge, or if you can't, um, again, our unified voices are exactly what's, what matters. And so definitely support the ATA. Um, and then uh, Dr. Schneider, uh, president of Lavango. It was a tremendously enriching conversation, albeit an hour. Um, I would love to re-engage in 18 months time and see if we are bringing, <laughs> bringing delight and, and engaging humanity back. Because I think those are um, a pure North Star. And I think collectively, um, we owe it to, to society to deliver on um, operationally, uh, July 21st, come back. We have building the digital doctors. A lot of questions about, hey, what about the doctors in telehealth? What about us? Well, we hope to actually engage around that in concepts of workflow and what is the, what do these technical solutions mean in the practice? So not just physicians, but nurse practitioners and all allied health uh, professionals. How do we bring value, practice, efficiency, and actually pleasure? back into the delivery of healthcare. So join us on July 21st. Again, it's Bill Morris with Transformation Tuesdays, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.